Good day, everyone, and welcome to our confidential report for August month. Um, we're going to start in America as usual. On your screen, you should see the S and P 500, and I've put some annotations on there. By now, the effect of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, is becoming clearer. The second quarter, up to the end of June, was very bad in America, as expected. Certainly the worst quarter. We should expect things to improve now from this quarter onwards. US GDP, gross domestic product, shrank by 9.5% because of the lockdowns. Weekly unemployment claims which are normally around 200,000, jumped to 6 million. But they have now declined back to 1.4 million, and they seem to have stabilized at that level. Consumer spending in America fell by 10.1% in the quarter. But the big tech companies are booming. Amazon saw its sales up by 40% with its profits doubling in the quarter to $5.2 billion just in that one quarter. It spent 9 billion rand on expanding its warehouses and capacity. Obviously, Americans are buying online at a great pace. Apple came out with results, 11.2 billion rand worth of profits in the second quarter. And it's mainly because of raised sales of iPads, and Mac computers, they were very strong. Tech shares generally are driving Wall Street up. The pandemic will obviously have a legacy and that will take a while to recover from, but America is blessed with having these powerful high-tech companies and they are holding that economy together. There certainly have been some casualties and the unemployment uh, claims are still high we believe that they will come down and relatively quickly. Obviously, the move towards work from home and educate yourself from home is having a big impact on IT and high-tech companies. Offices are seen as being redundant in many cases. A lot of companies who have closed their offices are thinking whether or not they should reopen them. And I believe that after the pandemic is behind us, there will be far fewer companies with offices than there are now. And even the companies which do keep offices, most of their staff will be working from home. That's obviously good for high-tech companies. Board and management meetings are now done online through Zoom. And that obviously also improves productivity because people don't have to travel around. They can work comfortably from their homes. It's much better. Obviously, Trump, Donald Trump is creating volatility um, with his on-again, off-again trade war with China. Wednesday and th Thursday last week, uh, he produced a couple of tweets about sanctions against China and that caused Wall Street to collapse. Uh, uh, well, for a little bit, uh, and then um, on Friday last week he suddenly recanted and Wall Street went up strongly. Apple on Friday jumped 5% just on that one day. And the S&P 500, as you can see from your screen here, is just 2.3% now below its all-time record high, which was 3386 made on the 19th of February this year. The V-bottom is virtually complete, as you can see here from the chart. And we should pass the record high fairly soon, probably in the next couple of weeks, and certainly well before the November elections. No doubt Donald Trump will take credit for that, but it really has very little to do with him. In fact, he is an impediment to the recovery of Wall Street. I expect that when it reaches this record high of 3386 and it's just 80 points behind that, there will be some backing and filling. Um, there will be resistance at that 3386 level. There is also a slight possibility that we could see a double top here, in which case the market will obviously fall off very heavily. But we think that that is unlikely. I think that the it will take a few attempts to get through 3386 and make a new record high. But that once that record high is surpassed, 
we should see the market go up very strongly. And of course, this is what we've been predicting and telling you about uh, since the pandemic began, that it would be a V-bottom and that we, it would be relatively short and that we would make a new record high within a reasonable time. All right, let's turn our attention to South Africa. First, I want to start by looking at the sort of political situation in the country. It's quite clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the political landscape in South Africa. The war with the ANC appears to have subsided somewhat. Cyril Ramaphosa is not fighting so much for his political life as he was. The supplementary budget was approved by Parliament, but the big question remains, is it politically feasible? Can we actually do a further 230 billion rands worth of cuts from the budget on top of the 160 billion which was in the February budget? That must mean a sharp reduction in the civil service, and strike action seems inevitable. So this will come down to a test of political will. Both Moody's and Standard & Poor's, the international ratings agencies, doubt our ability to implement that revised supplementary budget. And the, ba the ANC, let's face it, has a bad track record of implementing economic reforms. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a great test of the country's discipline. And the ANC is facing the fact that the South African public really does lack discipline. And this can be seen in the flagrant abuse of our road system and the fact that for only 4% of traffic fines are now being paid. But it means that Cyril Ramaphosa's orders and the decisions that are made in Parliament are not really carried out by the public, or at least not carried out fully. That obviously impacts directly on the pandemic. Also, the civil service is incapable of acting effectively on political instructions. 25 years of nepotism and black economic empowerment have resulted in incompetent, in incompetent and corrupt officials being placed in positions of power. And clawing our way back from that situation is bound to be difficult. And now there are allegations of widespread spread corruption in the tenders for PPE, uh, that's personal protective equipment, and food parcels which have been handed out in these uh, days of the pandemic. This damages the ANC significantly, and, and Cyril Ramaphosa's image has taken a knock. Overseas investors are increasingly getting the idea that corruption in the ANC is systemic, Nine years of Zupta Gupta control, Zuma Gupta control, and nepotistic and corrupt appointments, bloated, overpaid, and heavily unionized civil service that is far less effective than it used to be. So it will be difficult, it is difficult for South Africa to get through this COVID 19 phase. But is the pandemic coming to an end? I saw this morning that yesterday we only had 4,456 cases. That is significantly down. In fact, only two weeks ago, on the 24th of July, we hit a record 13,944 cases. That's just two weeks ago. The problem is, can we trust the numbers? The ANC, of course, is under enormous pressure now. If they can show that they have beaten this pandemic, it will be a feather in their cap. But I look also at the um, excess, what they call the excess number of deaths in South Africa, which is where they take the number of deaths in South Africa in any month and compare it to the same month last year before the pandemic started. And it's clear from these statistics that the official figures of, of uh, the death toll of COVID-19 are way understated, um, probably by 60% or more. So uh, we, we have to take these figures with a pinch of salt. Also, of course, we have to understand that there's a possibility that the figures are being fudged deliberately. We have to think about that in South Africa. 
But every country has excess deaths, which are not uh, accounted for in the official death toll of their COVID-19 statistics. The same has happened all over the world. All right, let's turn our attention now to the economy, and I'd like to just begin by drawing your attention to the fact that uh, there's a big difference between a journalist and an analyst. In the Business Day on the 15th of July, Chris Gilmore, who's a columnist for the Business Day, wrote this in one of his articles. He said, The economic fallout from the pandemic is likely to be far worse than originally forecast, both globally and in the South African context. This is typical sensationalist press. Doom and gloom sells newspapers, sells print, and that is a worldwide phenomenon. The newsprint doesn't want to see this crisis being resolved because it's their meal ticket. And there's a huge dichotomy between what the journalists are saying, that everything is getting worse, and what the investors are doing, as you can see from the chart on your screen. In fact, the day before Chris Gilmore's article appeared in the press, the S&P rose by 1.34%. And as you know, it's now just 2.3% below its all-time high. Clearly, the investors do not agree with Gilmore. So who is right? Gilmore, of course, has nothing really riding on his prediction. If he's wrong, he's wrong. But the investors have billions of US dollars riding on their prediction. And they believe that the economy in America is recovering rapidly, that COVID-19 is going to come under control by the end of this year, if not early next year. And we believe that those investors are right and that the S&P 500 will make a new record high very soon, as we've been predicting since March. In South Africa, our gross domestic product shrank by 2% in the first quarter of this year. That makes the third quarter now that we've had negative growth before the COVID-19 position began. The second quarter will probably be far worse. In fact, it will be the worst. And after that, we expect subsequent quarters to be better. And the improvement should be fairly rapid and off a low base. The Monetary Policy Committee did not change its prediction much for 2020 GDP when it met the other day. They still believe that the South African economy or GDP growth will shrink by 7.3% this year. That's just up from their prediction of 7% a little while back. And that's quite a comfort because a lot of uh, private sector economists are talking about 10% or more. But the Reserve Bank is is saying 7.3%, and I'm inclined to believe them. And in 2021, they predict that the economy will actually grow by 3.7%. In fact, the governor of the Reserve Bank, Kanyago, says that the economy has actually improved, had actually improved in the the last set of uh, financials. The latest 0.25% interest rate cut brings the total cuts for the year to 3%, 300 basis points. Over time, such a massive cut in rates must have an impact on the economy. Everyone who's got a bond, a mortgage bond, is paying far less on their bond every month. Of course, those who lost their jobs are in a parlous situation. It doesn't help them hugely that their bond is less because they've got no income. So we can expect spending to shrink dramatically as people who lost their jobs desperately try to re-establish themselves, find new jobs, find a source of income. In an open letter, 100 economists and academics have said that the government is not spending enough. They need to spend more, borrow more and spend more in order to overcome this uh, economic crisis. But Kuban Naidu who is obviously uh, in the Treasury. He says that the government has no spare resources, mainly due to the Zuma Gupta Gupta theft of the last nine years, and the deficit cannot really be allowed to go much above 15.7%, or otherwise South Africa runs the danger of defaulting on its debts. Argentina recently defaulted on $65 billion of debt, which has a massive and long-term impact on its credit rating. And every housewife can tell you, if you are in debt, 
You don't get out of debt by borrowing more and spending madly. That's not how to get out of debt. That's not how to resolve the situation. Tito Mboweni, our esteemed Minister of Finance, says we simply can't borrow and spend ourselves out of debt. That is populism. The Reserve Bank only bought about half the number of bonds in June that it bought in May, and that's a good sign. It now has about 36 billion rands worth of government bonds, and it plans to sell them back into the market over a period of time. It says still that it does not need quantitative easing, but we see that as probably inevitable, sooner or later. Retail sales in April were down by 50% from 2019. But of course, that was the month of the lockdown. And they were down only by 12% in May, which is very encouraging, really. And June should be actually much better because we went to level three of the lockdown at that stage. The lower bond rates and the drop in the petrol price will also put more money in consumers' pockets. But consumers will be scared. They will be reluctant to spend. They will be hoarding cash and repaying debt. They will only start spending again when they feel financially confident, which will probably only be sometime next year. But we do believe that consumer spending should bounce back strongly as soon as the pandemic really begins to fade. And of course, the pandemic and the impact on the economy is taking out all the weak businesses in the economy, those which had excessive debt levels, which were not well prepared, had no reserves to fall back on, such as, for example, Edcon. The stronger businesses survive, and they actually take up the business that the weaker businesses no longer can do. So that is a normal and healthy process within a capitalist economy. The weaker go to the wall, the stronger will survive and benefit from their failures. BankServe produces a take-home pay index, which is very interesting. And it looks at the take-home pay, or the amount of money that is basically deposited into consumers' bank accounts. Um, they cover about 36% of the entire workforce. So their, their index is very useful and interesting and, and obviously a good indication. And in June month, consumers were paid 21% less than they were in June of 2019. So that shows you the impact of the COVID-19 situation. Obviously, we expect that position to improve as businesses start going, more people will be back at work, uh, pay cuts will be removed after a while, and obviously there are UIF payments for those people who are not getting paid in full. About 30% of the people in the uh, bank serve take-home pay index are civil servants, who of course have had no pay cuts at all. So the figures for the private sector are probably worse than 21%, probably closer to 30%. And it's estimated that between 2 and 3 million jobs have been lost during the lockdown, which shows that the impact of the virus has been substantial on the economy. The renewed clampdown on alcohol and the new curfew seems to be working if we take the COVID cases into account. They are falling here. But it's had an impact on that industry, a huge impact. The liquor industry calls it a disaster. In the first lockdown, they lost 18 billion rand. Now there's a new lockdown which will last for another two months. They want each tavern owner to be given 20,000 rand to get through this period. There are 34,500 tavern owners, and for tavern owners you need to read Shabin's. Another impact of this uh, on the liquor industry is that AB InBev has decided to review a 5 billion rand investment that they were going to make into South Africa. Heineken has also decided, because they are the second largest beer producer in the world now, about one-fifth of the size of AB InBev. But anyway, they've also decided to review their expansion plans in South Africa. We've also seen Consul Glass this morning reporting that they are not going to go ahead with a one and a half billion rand expansion of their factory because of the reduced demand as a result of the ban on liquor sales. So all of these are impacts on the economy which will have to work through the system over time. On the good news side... The inflation rate dropped to just 2.1% in May, 
that's the consumer price index, which is the lowest level it's been for many years, and well below the bottom of the target range, which is between 3 and 6%. It justifies the Monetary Policy Committee's rate cut. But the rate cutting, in our opinion, is probably over now. I doubt if we see many more rate cuts, maybe another quarter percent later on in the year. The IMF, of course, approved our loan, uh, so they should because we are paid-up members and in good standing with the IMF. And that loan is at a rate of just 1%, which compares with the 9% which the government is currently paying on bonds in this country. And, of course, it will be combined with other loans from people like the World Bank, um, from the BRICS, BRICS Bank. Um, but these loans together will not be anywhere near enough. Tax collections this year are expected to be short about 300 billion rand. And South Africa definitely faces a fiscal cliff. It faces a debt trap. The government does. And we believe that in time, they will come to the realization that quantitative easing or printing the money is the only real solution in this situation. All right, let's look at some other things that have happened in the economy. Pretoria, or Chwane as it's known now, has agreed to increase wages for its staff by 6.5%. That's three times the inflation rate. And we think that's just plainly absurd. It's also dangerous because other municipalities will want to follow that same pattern. They're already demanding that they get the same pay increase. And that will quickly gobble up the 20 billion rand that Ramaphosa has allocated to the municipalities to, to fight COVID-19. So the municipalities have got exactly the same problem as the government. They are overstaffed by overpaid people who are basically incompetent and corrupt. Eskom is looking a little brighter. They finally decided to act on a judgment which was handed down in 2018, and that judgment enabled them to take control of the Maluti municipality's bank account in order to recover the debt which it owes to them. This is the first time they've ever done that. They're also suing 12 former Eskom employees and politicians to recover the debt which they say is owed to them as a result of the corrupt and criminal activities. They're suing them for 3.8 billion. So it's people like Molefe, Singh, the finance director that used to be, Coco, and Zwane, who is still currently a minister serving in the government, as well as the Guptas. Now this is unusual for a civil case to come before a criminal case. Normally, uh, people who have a civil action wait until they get a criminal conviction and then base their civil case on that. But people are getting tired of how long it is taking for the, for the country, for the government, to bring these criminal actions against leading politicians particularly. The Hawks say there is a criminal investigation into what happened at Eskom, but it is just progressing, you know. But Zwane is still a serving minister in parliament. So the CEO of Eskom, Andre de Reiter, like many South Africans, is obviously running out of patience. And he's doing a lot of work. I think he's working 16 hours a day. I see that he's implementing load shedding in those areas which have the most illegal connections. In other words, you must read those areas which have squatter camps, because that's where the illegal connections are primarily taking place. The objective Clearly, everyone must pay for their electricity. It's a simple objective. We also see that Denel is now on the same path as SAA. In 2019, they got 1.8 billion rand from the government to bail them out. <clears throat> they got a further 576 million in 2020, this year. But they're still cash-strapped and can only pay out 40% of salaries. Tito Mbueni has said that there will be no more bailouts for state-owned enterprises. So it looks like they're going for business rescue or liquidation. Right, let's turn our attention to the rand. Um, just want to quickly get that on the screen for you. In our view, <clears throat> the rand is basically undervalued. 
and we have anticipated for some time that it will strengthen. That is what we believed. Um, there are two factors, really, which impact on the strength of the RAND. The one is international sentiment, which, as we've discussed often, oscillates between risk on and risk off. So when it's risk on, the RAND tends to weaken for that reason because overseas investors withdraw their funds from South Africa and place them in overseas investments uh, where, they, where they are safer, like U.S. Treasury bills. That's the one factor. That's not, nothing to do with South Africa. It's really completely independent of this country. The second factor is overseas investors' perceptions of the local reform process, the reform process which uh, Cyril Ramaphosa is trying to implement. Now, since the last confidential report about a month ago, as you can see, the RAND was strengthening very nicely. We had a moment of weakness over here due to an international risk-on, risk-off situation, and then it continued to strengthen. But in the last few days, partly because of Trump's sudden decision to uh, renew sanctions against China, which resulted in a little bit of a risk-on scenario in the international markets, but then when Trump recanted and the markets in America, Wall Street and the S&P 500 recovered, our RAND didn't recover with them, but continued to weaken, as you can see here. Now, this continued weakness, we believe, is because of a loss of faith by overseas investors in our ability to continue with the reform process. And that loss of faith is a direct result, in our opinion, of the re revelation of corruption within the public health budget. In other words, where corrupt ANC officials and other officials have been stealing the money that was supposed to be used to fight uh, corona. That's what's been happening. And some of those people are very close to Cyril Ramaphosa, and we believe that that has severely damaged the ANC's reputation internationally amongst international investors, and that's why the RAND has continued to weaken. Um, and it's weakened very sharply. It's, it's weakened from about 1640 to about 1740, about a RAND against the U.S. dollar as a result of that. So the ANC is becoming seen as systemically corrupt, and there have not simply not been enough prosecutions. We now need one or two or three high-level high-ranking prosecutions of people who are in government and who have been sitting there and they've been almost immune to prosecution, it seems. I think that would recover the situation. If we had a spate of arrests and even a conviction or two of high-level people, that would start to reverse the situation. Right, let's talk now about commodities. In May month, Mining output was 30% below the same month last year. But that's considerably better than the 50% it was down in April compared to April last year. June should be better. The South African recovery depends on our mining industry. The South African economy is still export-led. So when we are getting good prices for our exports and we have strong demand from overseas for our exports, our economy recovers. Now, during the uh, month, one of our clients, uh, Mr. Kurt Jordan, uh, drew to our attention the fact that the silver price may well be about to follow the gold price up. So I'm just going to show you the silver price here in dollars. Here it is. Now, I'm just going to put a bit more data on the screen here. And you can see that the silver price has been in a, in, a, in a sideways market for a long time and has recently broken up out of that sideways market. There you can see the sideways pattern. This is the COVID-19 aberration. We regard this breakdown through the lower uh, support level as an aberration, which was quickly reversed. And now it's broken above the upper limit here, showing that silver is indeed following gold. So, Mr. Jordan drew our attention to the fact that silver normally uh, starts to go up after gold. In other words, it's a lagging indicator behind gold. 
And he drew our attention to the fact that it's now made a significant upside breakout. So we decided because of this long sideways movement that we would do a point and figure analysis of it and look for a horizontal count. We did that analysis and we found a horizontal count of six in this period, both on the RAND and in the US dollar, but not an upside breakout yet. We haven't yet got an upside breakout in that uh, horizontal count. So for a horizontal count to be accurate, we need to have that upside breakout and we haven't got it quite yet. But the horizontal count, if we get that upside breakout, projects a silver price of about $45 an ounce. $45.92, in fact, to be precise. Now, horizontal counts are generally about 70 to 80% accurate. You may recall that a while back in uh, December of 2016, we did a horizontal count on the S&P 500 when it was about 2,200. And we said then that the S&P will go to 3,027. And now it's, of course, well above that. So our experience with horizontal counts and point and figure is very positive. So if we get this upside breakout, which we probably will get in the next day or two on silver, you can expect the silver price to more or less double from around $22, $23 a, 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 an ounce up to $45. Right, let's look at some companies. <clears throat> And right at the start here today, I want to talk a little bit about something which Philip Kotler, the well-known international management consultant, said. Philip Kotler always used to say, the most important question that a company can ask is, what business are we in? And then by subtraction, of course, what business are we not in? Because the most important thing in a business is to focus. The secret of business is to do one thing and do it exceptionally well. And we've just had the example now of Edcon, which is, you would think, a focused business focused on retail, of clothing particularly. It's a clothing retailer, but it's gone bust in this COVID-19 period. But Edcon had, had done some strange things in its time. It bought CNA in 2002 for $141 million. And for the life of us, we cannot see any synergy between CNA and Edgar's. There's just no synergy at all, except for the fact that they're both retailers. There's no real interaction or synergies between these two businesses. And now the business rescue practitioners have finally sold CNA for one rand, including all its debt. And CNA itself was bought back by management and they now have to make a decision about what business CNA is in. I mean, is CNA a stationary business? Do they sell stationary? Is that what they do there? Or do they sell books? Maybe they're a book dealer. If they are, I can think of other book dealers that are much more focused than, than them, like exclusive books, for example. If I wanted a book, I wouldn't go to CNA to look for it. I would go to exclusive books or another book dealer. Because that's what they do. They do books, and that's all they do. Do they sell sweets at CNA? Or computers? Or toys? Or music? What business are they in? In fact, they do all of those things, but they do them badly. The new owners, who are management, will have to decide what business they are in. But it's something for you to remember as a private investor. When you look at a company, try to decide how focused they are because that can be a very critical factor in their success. And then I'd like to draw your attention to the, to the banking index, uh, which is the SAPI, S-A-P-Y index. <clears throat> Here you can see it, and you can see that the banking index came down very heavily and has been moving really sideways and slightly upwards, but it's still on a very, very reasonable price-earnings ratio, average price-earnings ratio of 8.22 and a dividend yield of 16%. I mean, that's unbelievable. You must remember that banks are service companies which get most of their income in an annuity form. So that is the kind of business that we as private investors really look out for. 
a company with annuity income which doesn't have a lot of the working capital problems of manufacturers and other people in the, in the business community. And they're trading on a ridiculously low price earnings ratio and a ridiculously high dividend yield. We believe that in time, the, uh, the big institutions will realize that the banks are underpriced and will start buying back into these banks. In fact, Alan Gray has even admitted already that they are busy buying up First National Bank and Standard Bank. So we advise private investors to get into these banking shares now that they are cheap. You will get an almost risk-free good return from this. All right, now I'd like to just talk about Stadio. Stadio, as you know, uh, was, was split off from Curra Holdings, and uh, which is, uh, Curra Holdings, of course, is the, is the uh, education arm of PSG. And here you can see, I'm just going to put a little bit less data on the screen so that we can see these figures a little bit more clearly. Here you can see the progress of Stadio uh, since August 2018. In August 2018, here you can see they were on a price earnings ratio of 300. That's almost unheard of. It's almost unheard of, right? In 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 the uh, on the JSC, and that price earnings ratio came down and down and down. As you can see, this long-term downward trend line, down and down and down, and eventually, over here, it was on a price earnings ratio of about 17. It now looks as if it's breaking up, and the PE ratio today is a much more reasonable 15.88. We believe that this share is a company that will benefit directly from COVID-19 because it's in tertiary education, which is mostly online. In the year to December 31st of uh, 2019, their turnover was up 29%. And in a trading statement, which they produced just the other day for the six months to the 30th of June, they reported that enrollments were up 10% to more than 31,000. 25,000 of those 31,000 people are doing distance learning, which means that they are at home and they are getting their education over the internet. So we think that this is a good company and that it's reasonably priced at last. The next company I want to look at is MTN, which is another company which we believe will benefit from uh, COVID-19. Now, of course, MTN is the largest cell phone provider in uh, Africa. <clears throat> And uh, they have taken a bit of a pounding because of difficulties in Nigeria. But they operate in 21 countries. They have a massive data provision side to their business. So it's not just about cell phones. It's also about data. And data is being used enormously in COVID-19 when people are in lockdown for entertainment. So this is a service company with a very strong annuity income which is just above its, above its net asset value. So we think it's very cheap at these levels around, around 60 Rand. Below 60 Rand, it looks very cheap to us. So there's another one which will benefit from COVID-19 and which looks like it's um, very reasonably priced. Now, in the uh, last confidential report last month, I drew your attention to Labat. Um, I'll just put that, screen on the, uh, that chart on the screen for you. And you'll see here that what we drew your attention to the, was the fact that Labat had given a very clear on-balance volume buy signal. Now, the on-balance volume uh, picks up a rise in volume with rising prices. And we actually wrote an article about this over here on the 22nd of June. And after the article, the share price went up significantly, about another 37%, I think, in a, in a few weeks. So the on-balance volume gives you a buy signal, but it's a short-term buy signal. You must, you must uh, get in and get out. So it's not something we usually do, but here we are talking about a technical trading signal where you buy into something because of the insider trading which has been picked up by on-balance volume. So on-balance volume picks up unusually large volumes with small increases in price because that is what... That is a typical sign of insider trading. Somebody in the company knows something and they are accumulating the shares, buying them up from people who don't know, and then the share goes up once the news is made public. In Labat's case, uh, that is more or less exactly what happened, and if you'd acted on that signal, you would have made a nice return. 
Now today I'd like to draw your attention to a few other examples uh, of the same on balance volume. So I'll just draw your attention to them. I'm not going to spend a long time on this because I just want you to get the principle. On balance volume is available. Anyone can have a look at it. Here again you can see this is quantum uh, and you can see that acute angle, upward angle, rising prices, the share price went up very steeply. It's tailed off since then, but this was an opportunity to make a very nice profit. Uh, the insiders were piling in over here, and the share went up very strongly. In fact, at the time that it gave the signal, the share price was 375. It reached a high of 990, so you almost tripled your money there. So that's quantum. In vector... Uh, is another example um, and, and this company also gave the same kind of on balance volume signal and here you can see it very strong uh, signal and the share price went up after that and is still going up and then finally uh, pan-african this, this signal occurred some time ago there you can see the acute angle rising prices and the share price just keeps on going up over here when it gave that signal if you take it as somewhere here the share was trading for two rand 41 uh, today it's trading at five rand 80. all right folks that's about all i have for you today so i hope you got something of interest out of it and uh, i hope that everything uh, progresses well for you in the month to come as far as investments are concerned and i'll talk to you again on the first wednesday of september Thank you for listening to me.